When I say deep, you say ecology. Deep, deep, psychedelic consciousness and deep ecology. Deep, deep. Deep ecology, we're right about to do it. Everybody sitting down. So thank you so much. To everyone here for coming out. Um, some of you know me from the Green Spaces New York co-working community, which became Impact Hub NYC. Um, and then since that's been happening, I started working in the psychedelic space in 2021, uh, doing PR for New Shama. And I was bridging the past work and the still current work of some of my um, clients in regeneration, social impact, and just became so, so fascinated with the psychedelic space. But I started to feel a little bit of guilt, some climate action guilt, spending so much time in psychedelics when the planet needs so much of our help. And the work started to come together for me when one of my clients, uh, Sean Paul, he's the CEO of Ajito Verde, um, which is a regenerative company in Mexico. And he said, environmental problems are human problems. And it was like, oh, aha. So the more and more I started to look into psychedelics and study the space, I really wanted to bring people together at this intersection. And there's amazing people here tonight doing incredible work. Some of them are going to be speaking. Other ones are people in this room who have happened to come across this invite and who came tonight, thankfully, and we're really excited to have everyone here. But the collective work and passion and influence of everyone in this room is just mind-blowing. So I encourage everyone here to meet each other. We had a much bigger response than we expected, about 100 tickets that were sold tonight. And we've only been planning this for a couple of weeks. So I think it really speaks to the amount of interest there is at this intersection. So I definitely want to create a directory of people here tonight, um, recognize all the work that everyone's doing, welcome ideas and collaboration on future events at the intersection of psychedelics and climate action. So we're going to get started. Roger Wu, come on up. So Roger's going to tell you what inspired him to put together this art that you see here, Race for Social Action. What inspired me to put this together? Well, a lot of different things did. Um, partially psychedelics to some degree. Over the pandemic, I had an accountability partner. And what that means is that every week I got a phone call. What did you do this week? It's kind of stressful. <laughs> Through the pandemic, I got a lot of work done on the creative side. Some of, the, some of these ideas came about. Um, and then sadly, she passed away. She got in a car accident. Um, and then my new accountability, accountability partner became Anita Durst, the founder of Shishama. And she said, this is the day that you're going to get your space. And then it became real. And I don't know if Iran and Adina are still here, but they introduced me to some fungus upstate. And it kind of changed the way that I saw things. And it made me realize that sometimes the best ideas are not yours, or the, the best ideas are always yours. And... The reason why I say that is um, from my day job, I realized that in terms of motivating people, the best way to do it is not to say, this is what I want you to do, but rather, here's what we need to get done. This is the quote unquote North Star, right? Figure out how to get there. And now it's their idea. And when it's their idea, it's much stronger than if it's your idea that they're executing. So... Part of this thought experience was to get people to think about things. And there's no right or wrong answer. Actually, every answer is right. Um, but it hopefully gives you a, a way to think about things in a different way that you might not have thought of before. And that was kind of the impetus behind the entire project. So I will be around later and we'll lead a tour. And thank you all for coming. You know, we talk about psychedelics and nature. Um, you know, I was on a retreat with the assemblage community, but I had been working in sustainability for many years. And then I was taken on a, a nature walk by some facilitators. And suddenly I felt more connected to nature than I ever had in my entire life. And I realized that, you know, here I am trying to do work for the planet, yet I was missing that connection. And anything that can help create that connection can be very, very strong. 
Um, so our next speaker is Saren Chorney, who's a guest artist, and she's going to be telling you about her exhibition, 50 Years in the Future, if and when lions are extinct. I am a journalist. I had written some stories for People magazine about some rescue lions. The uh, nonprofit and the sanctuary invited me to Africa to learn about the work they do um, and to also learn about the lion farming industry in South Africa. My piece is about that. It is also about the future, a species that is iconic, that is also endangered. There may be a child who loves lions and the only place that the child will see a lion is in a virtual museum. In the same way that kids today might love dinosaurs, they might decorate their room with dinosaurs. In the not too distant future, species like lions and rhinos and elephants will no longer exist on this planet. There are only between 20 and 30,000 wild lions left. Uh, and about 20 years ago, there were 75,000 wild lions left. So it just goes to show how quickly a species that is um, revered and the king of the beasts and seems you know, everywhere in pop culture, it's on Broadway, it's a sports team mascot, is actually, you know, very quickly uh, declining. That is very sad, but there are things we can do about this. If we're a tourist and we're going to Africa, if we're going anywhere and we want to have a nature experience or an animal experience, we can do our research and we can find out if those places are ethical and sustainable. When I was a kid and when a lot of us were kids, we loved animals. We maybe had a favorite animal. As we get older, when we're adults, we forget. Habitat loss is very real. This species only lives on 25% of its original habitat. And habitat and climate change go hand in hand. One of the reasons that people like to explore psychedelics is to achieve a feeling of wonder and awe and I think when we're kids, we naturally have that feeling of wonder and awe. Um, just learning about the world is wonderful. How will we actually make things happen? And how can we quantify change? I was very inspired by the next speaker that you'll meet, Dr. Bennett Zellner, who was speaking at the Brooklyn Psychedelic Society. He shared a very tangible example and can tell us about his, a study that he's doing that exemplifies how psychedelics can influence leadership. My name is Bennett Zellner. Um, as Marissa said, I'm a professor. I teach at the University of Maryland at the Smith School of Business. I teach economics. And uh, I'm different from most economists. It, it, I'm what's called a regenerative economist. Most economists are interested at, at some level at explaining and sort of justifying the existing economic system. My interest is in transforming the existing economic system into one that creates broad-based well-being rather than serving the interests of a concentrated few. I, I do a lot of work in the psychedelic space. Um, I advise organizations in the space that are interested in developing regenerative approaches to delivering psychedelic-assisted mental health treatment. So kind of not falling into the same business-as-usual patterns that are contributing to a lot of mental distress in the first place. And I also do research in this area. The research is at the intersection of economics, psychedelics and leadership. In economics, regenerate, regenerative, the term regenerative, refers to a pattern of activity in which resources circulate in order to strengthen and restore the natural, economic, and social systems that support our individual and collective well-being. So this circulatory pattern, this is based on the pattern of natural systems, like, like forests, which circulate nutrients and information in order to support the thriving of the system and its ability to regenerate itself in the future. This is the opposite of what we have today. The system we have today is an extractive system. It's extractive in the sense that all resources are extracted from bottom to top, from periphery to center, to serve the interests of a single group, financial investors over all others. As you have probably inferred, I think that psychedelics have the potential to contribute to, to help catalyze the emergence of a regenerative pattern. And there, there are a number of reasons why I think this, but I think the most important one is that psychedelics, psychedelic experiences have the ability to counter the foundational myth of the extractive paradigm, which is the myth of disconnection, the myth that we are disconnected from each other and from our mother, the earth. This myth is reflected and perpetuated by all of our major institutions, laws, 
norms, the corporate form. And these institutions, in turn, enable, facilitate the extractive processes that are destroying. So these extractive processes are um, yeah, at the core of environmental issues. They're also at the core of issues that we have in a range of other systems, all of which are in crisis and reflected in such indicators as income inequality, um, rising rates of mental distress, uh, migration flows. You know, as, as Marissa said, all of these problems are ultimately human problems. So psychedelics have the ability to counter this myth of disconnection because one of the hallmarks of psychedelic experience is interconnectedness. Psychedelic experiences can help us feel our intrinsic interconnectedness to everything and everybody and everybody else, which I was also reminded of in, in, in the comment that you made. The hypothesis is that if psychedelic experiences can help people feel this interconnectedness, they can help engender the types of personal transformative experiences that will lead to changes in behavior that will ultimately contribute to the emergence of a regenerative pattern. So we're examining a, a version of this hypothesis in, in this research project with uh, a colleague of mine at the University of Maryland, another professor named Rochelle Sampson. And what we're looking at specifically, we're examining the effects of psychedelic assisted consciousness expanding experiences on decision making by organizational leaders. And this is a really important population to study. These people have the ability to serve as force multipliers. If they can feel their, their connectedness, then they're likely to make decisions that take into account, we think, broader ranges of stakeholders and that also account for a much longer time horizon. They really have the potential to be change agents in the emergence of a regenerative pattern. The study is in progress. And we have a number of additional cohorts scheduled uh, later this year. We've had our pilot cohort thus far. And I, I will relate just one uh, little anecdote from it, which, which is the one that Marissa heard when I was speaking at the Brooklyn Psychedelic Society. So uh, we had our pilot cohort last summer in the Netherlands. And we, have, we bring these leaders together in a group. They, they, they're, they're attending a, psychedelic, a leadership-focused psychedelic retreat. And we wanted to have a very light touch with kind of our, there was a little bit of a curriculum around uh, systems change and, and regenerative economics, but we, we didn't want to make it too heavy. Nonetheless, we, we, was, we were probably a little bit more heavy handed than we meant to be. It was also the first night, it was after dinner, people were a little bit grumpy. And a after we kind of went through some of this material, one of the more vocal participants said, why, why are you talking about this? Like, well, why, this is a psychedelic retreat. Like, like, well, what, what, what is the point of all this? So, you know, we, we, we were kind of mortified. I mean, we, we, the last thing you want to do is piss off your, your, your research participants. <laughs> However, um, things all worked out. There were two psilocybin, uh, two dosing sessions at the retreat. And after the first one, there was an integration circle. And when it got to this person, I actually thought they were joking at first, I, but this person said in all, serious, in all seriousness, everything they said, everything that the professors, Rochelle and Bennett said, started to make sense. And just again, to kind of continue with the example of this one person, this person went on, this person was a founder, a serial entrepreneur who decided to focus all of their energy after this on a project in the mental health space. And also very importantly, kind of changed their entire approach to the project and uh, is working on developing financing mechanisms, governance mechanisms, a whole range of mechanisms to insulate this project from the extractive pressures that would otherwise be transmitted through these mechanisms. So that's one small, that one small example gives me, you know, encourages me. Once we finish the research, I hope to have more uh, examples like that to share with you. If we think about how you know, one or two psilocybin dosings could have a positive effect on leadership and regenerative models. You know, if we need this big collective shift in consciousness to actually, you know, make the climate action happen, that can be a major part of the shift. So from the leadership, but also from everywhere, right? All of us here tonight, everyone that we know, you know, we need mass participation and buy-in, whether you're a leader going on a retreat or whether you're someone um, in the mental health space. Next, Dr. Julia Mirror to talk about her work with Nushama as Director of Strategy and Impact. She has a, a lightheartedness about her, and she and I share the idea that it's fun to play with these ideas 
And, you know, if you want to come up with creative solutions and outside the box thinking, you know, maintaining that creativity that psychedelics can inspire or calming the amygdala in the brain, which psychedelics are also a part of, can help spark these solutions. She's working in the legal off-label psychedelics industry in New York um, with ketamine. I joke that I'm a recovering physician. I got my medical degree. I knew I wanted to help. And when I got into the system, I realized that's not what we're doing. And it's good intentioned people trying to do the best they can with what they have. But what they have is a broken system. My own psychedelic experience during my like vacation during residency, where I realized I'm not buying what I'm selling. And if I stay, I won't make it. And we see a lot of physicians that are going through this. They don't understand why they're not okay, but they know that something's wrong. We see a lot of suicides and it's, it's devastating. And when I resigned, I thought that's it. I'm leaving medicine. And I really became curious about what is like, what does a psychedelic do? It gives you the opportunity to have a new perspective on your current, current state, whatever that is. And. A lot of times we talk about how psychedelics bring the shadow to surface, like it brings light to the shadows within us. And I truly believe that that's phase one. But once you've kind of done your own part, it brings light to the shadows in the systems that we live in. And there was a meme going around with, you know, it was like a picture of a Trojan horse and it showed um, ketamine, the legal psychedelic um, in the front and then inside it's all the other psychedelics. And I think it's psychedelics is the Trojan horse and systems changes inside. And the way that I look at it is, you know, what Sarah was saying with this childlike wonder about animals, we lose that. We become adults. We, we stop paying attention to everything outside. Some people have children. They're focused on that. They're, they're kind of, it becomes much smaller and we stop thinking about all these other things. And when you have a psychedelic, you kind of get this beginner's mind. You have this, you could see the same streets that you've seen every single day. And you're like, oh, there's tulips here. When you are in a job for a long time and you're kind of doing the same thing over and over again, you stop believe, you stop thinking about other ways that something could be. Um, in the US, we have an Adderall shortage. Adderall helps you focus in, focus in on something. It's something convergent thinking. You're just kind of focusing in. Psychedelics allow for divergent thinking. It's thinking about multiple things at once. And imagine if you can give an adult in a professional role in a big organization a chance to have a beginner's mind and look at the situations that they're in and think of the creative ways to change this. When psychedelics help you feel better, they make you want to be around longer and they make you start paying attention to the fact that we're not on the right path. I don't think that psychedelics, you know, you take psychedelics, you're now an angel and you're this amazing person and all of your problems are gone. Absolutely not. In fact, you may become more aware of the things that exist around you. But to what Marissa was saying, we also tap into creativity. So filmmakers, you know, we have this doom and gloom. We love all this, like extrapolations is a new show on Apple. Like we love seeing things go bad. If you go online, you can find all the things that are going bad. Young adults, kids, they're going online. They're just, they're devastated. We need more people coming up with stories about the positive thing, the, the good things that can happen. Start planting those seeds and start making it more popular to talk about hope. And I think that's what psychedelics offer. We are hopeless right now in a lot of ways, mental health crisis, fentanyl overdoses, but this is actually giving us hope. It's not gonna do it for us, but it's gonna give us an opportunity. Wendy Brower, someone I've had the pleasure of being a friend and supporting her organization, Green Map Systems, um, which she will tell you about, which maps local resources globally. And I don't know how many cities and countries now all around the world. She's been doing this work for 25 years. Thank you. Our environmental condition is a mirror of society's values. And to me, that's akin to Marissa's statement about her shift in consciousness. I heard that phrase back in the early 90s, and I wondered, how could I make that mirror invis uh, visible to everybody? I chose to make a map because that's a powerful way to share your perspective of the world. It's resource efficient and usable by people who don't read your language. So 
I had not made a map before, but I had met the orangutan who touched my consciousness in a profound way. This happened in the Arab night market in Yogyakarta, Indonesia. She and I locked eyes, and from her tiny cage, she threw me a stone. I caught it, and I turned green. Basically, I've worked in sustainability ever since. And though no mushrooms were involved, that moment had the impact on me akin to a psychedelic experience. I was open to new ways of thinking about the world and my potential impact in it. The Green Map concept has been applied by hundreds of local project leaders in 65 countries. And I know our trajectory has been boosted by cannabis and maybe not in micro. It's helped me manage both local and global projects, see beyond the borders, and work from a solutionary perspective. It helps me appreciate, amplify, and learn from the diversity of solutions and reflect how the maps and processes are imbued by local flavor and craft, how to apply systems thinkings to manage the flow of outcomes, ideas, and opportunities. With my background as an artist, cannabis has helped me understand what I unleashed and become a social sculptor. Microdosing is probably a part of my future, as especially as things get more complex, but it's really been since the last millennium for me. But cannabis was there years ago as I set intentions about getting involved on a professional and personal level that included working globally and sharing tools that made the world visible through a green lens. To have a powerful mood and mind shifter with a little puff. Then the climate becomes not a source of uncertainty, anger, and paralysis. It becomes a driver and a source of inspiration and the most compelling challenge of our lifetime. Psychedelics and microdosing can have the same effect, I'm sure. Thank you. Now we have two surprise speakers here tonight. Daniel Pinchbeck is here. Um, Daniel and I originally met through the Assemblage community. I don't know how many of you are familiar, but it was um, a wonderful co-working and event space at the intersection of consciousness and capitalism, where Daniel was frequently a speaker. He was very sought after. He hosted events. He spoke there every month. Um, I don't know of anyone doing more writing than him about the intersection of environmentalism and psychedelics. Please welcome Daniel up to the stage. Wow, it is a nice crowd. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm happy to be here. Actually, I've sort of, um, as Marissa uh, mentioned, I, mean, I wrote a lot about uh, environment and psychedelics. I wrote, my first book was called Breaking Open the Head. It came out in 2002. And uh, one of the key mo sort of moments in my life uh, happened in that, during the research of that book where I went down to the Amazon in Ecuador and visited an indigenous community called the Sequoia and uh, was confronted with how much of the Amazon had been kind of ruined by the uh, oil companies, uh, by, by Texaco and so on. And um, how basically what we, what we learned at that point was, I don't know if it was like several million acres of rainforest would be despoiled so that we could you know, extract enough fossil fuels to keep the US going for another like three or four days. Uh, and uh, each time we made this huge extraction, and that was just happening, you know, continually. So then I had a lot of hope um, that psychedelics, um, you know, particularly ayahuasca, could be this tool. I had, you know, I saw that as these, you know, oil companies were going into the jungle, this medicine was coming like out of the jungle, and I thought maybe um, um, that um, that medicine would, would would lead to this great awakening. Um, and then, you know, that was in 2002 before this whole psychedelic renaissance happened. The interest in psychedelics has exploded and so on. Uh, I also wrote a second book, uh, Quetzalcoatl Returns, looking at the prophecies of different uh, indigenous uh, cultures like the Hopi and the Maya and so on. What I've seen as the psychedelic movement has grown in popularity is this sort of um, focus on the psychological aspect of the experience and almost like... Um, you know, we have a, a very efficient kind of establishment mainstream culture that uh, takes whatever comes, you know, once, and when I wrote Breaking Up in the Head in 2002, I really, you couldn't even really talk about psychedelics uh, in public in New York. Like in, you know, I was part of these media circles. I wrote for like New York Times and Esquire. People would just mock you and the, and the substances were just ridiculed. And, and then there was this breakthrough of the psychedelics into, into the mainstream culture. And then that is like opportunity. You know, people can make academic careers, can form businesses, can, you know, so then you see the sort of our, the, our very efficient uh, capitalist sort of establishment, academic culture, kind of like assimilating psychedelics. But in that in that assimilation, it feels like 
the uh, transformational potential and the energy is getting sort of drained. From, from my perspective, we are in a desperate emergency around the ecological crisis, and we're not living as though we're in that you know, moment, uh, this, very, this very short moment that we have before. I mean, they're talking about the Amazon collapsing as a functional ecosystem in like 10 years now or something. And um, in the, in the uh, last fall, I was at an um, event. I mean, here I am still traveling around the world, which I still feel very guilty about. I went to an event in Paris in the fall where I was, I was speaking. And one of the guys who was speaking there um, worked with the Rand Corporation. And he's saying that like, um, you know, within the next decades, you know, billions of people might perish, um, you know, and we'll see mass migrations from the global south as it just simply becomes too hot there for people to, to survive. So we're on the cusp of these, you know, deep, deep systemic transformations. It appears, you know, may, maybe it won't happen, you know, but it, that's what the scientific evidence suggests. And I guess the only thing that we could really do at this point is, is we need to, you know, kind of... Um, have very clear-eyed compassion, you know, for everybody, you know, kind of like recognize that um, for whatever reason, we all created this, you know, construct, this reality together. And um, we have to, you know, reckon in the, in, the, in the very tangible reality of what all the scientific evidence is saying. I mean, why Extinction Rebellion is doing what they're doing and the last generation, you know, why, why, why these, you know, young people are like, you know, you know, kind of gluing themselves to, to trees or whatever they're doing right now. And, and, and then, you know, we have to, you know, sort of think strategically about where this is going. I, I should mention another thing that I did um, years ago when I realized the magnitude of what was coming. This was back in like 2005 or six. I started a network of local communities called Evolver. And we had like 60 or 70 local communities at its height in the US and around the world. And the idea, which I still think would be the right idea, is to create some kind of like self-organizing, scalable template for local communities to self-organize around a set of uh, you know, paradigm-shifting ideas like food sovereignty, which I think you, you mentioned, you know, um, alternative energy. Um, you know, I mean, I mean, even very basic things that we could be doing you know, we haven't been doing, whether it's like roof, rooftop gardens or insulating, you know, old buildings, they don't, they don't release so much heat. The, the, the capitalist system that we're in, unfortunately, stops us from being able to do all those things that we actually, you know, needed to do quite a while back. And we still don't really have a, a way, a way of an answer to that. And we don't have enough people even like thinking in that direction. And until then, we're kind of like just, just playing with the sense of, of um, you know, possibility. And I, I don't think that green capitalism has any hope in heck of, sign, of you know, dealing with the ecological emergency. Um, it's just, uh, everything just gets assimilated back into these kind of fraudulent sustainability paradigms and so on, or greenwashing and so on. So yeah, it would have to be some kind of much deeper, you know, people movement, civil society movement, and I just don't see it happening yet. So right at the moment, I'm teaching a course on the Western Hermetic tradition uh, and esotericism, and I've gotten very interested in just like, you know, maybe there are other pathways, you know, life doesn't have to go on forever. We can just enjoy what we got while we got it. So thank you very much. Something you said of many things just now, but the idea of playing with possibility in this, you know, emergency that we're in with the time that we have. The idea for this event at the beginning was originally to do a panel. And I thought we should do something a little more fun, a little more rapid fire. You know, we don't all have all the answers and we need buy-in from everyone. So why not do something playful where people can come together and share ideas and brainstorm and maybe some people will collaborate that meet here tonight. Maybe some people will have some new ideas or maybe they'll collaborate a year from now. And I shared the idea with, with Bennett and he said, Oh, like a, like a mycelial container for the people in the room. And I said, Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Actually. So we have one more surprise guest here tonight that I think can set the tone for the rest of the evening. His name is Nate Dufour and he is a professor. He also does performance art and he has prepared a song for us tonight to lead us into the rest of the evening. We have a whiteboard again. We also have a climate action step pad. So if you want to do anything that comes that you're inspired to do tonight and you want to create some next action steps, you can do that. Um, if you're shy, you can put them in the suggestion box. My father is a climate scientist who could not be here tonight, but you'll see a poster. I've seen many people commenting on it about the albedo effect and about um, reflectivity. So a lot of the current theories now about carbon solutions are about emissions. Um, a lot of my father's peer-reviewed work is about 
reducing the greenhouse gases and the the warming, the literal warming that's happening on the planet. So you'll see um, he is he's very opinionated as a scientist. You will see um, information saying what is the point of a Tesla if it's black because that will still be creating heat. So some simple things that you can do are like getting a white car, painting your roof white, painting some streets white. Does anyone here want to paint some streets white with me? Maybe we could do a pilot project. Okay, I've got some people. This is the kind of climate play that I'm hoping to gather here tonight. So I want to make sure to get people's info who want to do some of these fun exercises with me. I want to thank again, Roger Wu for having all of us. I want to thank Chishama, um, our guest artist, Saren. I want to thank the Brooklyn Psychedelic Society for spreading the word. Other people who are spreading the word, um, the Psychedelic Access Fund, New York Climate Tech, um, Sarah Rose Siskind, and Liz Friedland from Orbit, who just stepped in. Everyone say hi, Liz. Tomorrow night, if any of you are not from the psychedelic community and are more in the climate community, Liz is hosting an event tomorrow night at Noya House called Are Psychedelics Right for Me? So if you would like to RSVP, and you can hear from Dr. Julia Muir, who will be there again, along with Dr. Julie Holland and some other people, find Liz, RSVP. Um, there's also a WhatsApp group coming out of tonight, so where people can create those connections and we can post it there as well. Um, thank you again to Kervin, our photographer and videographer. Thank you for Sandro. Um, and there's so many just, I can't emphasize enough how excited that certain people showed up tonight that I've been trying to get to come to things for a while and who are just doing groundbreaking work from New York Times journalists to people in organizations about environmental psychology. Um, so if you haven't joined the WhatsApp group, I encourage you to do that. And thank you so much. So Nate, come on up here and lead us in your song. Hi, everybody. Um, as Marissa was saying, my name is Nathan. She was accurate about that. What is not quite accurate is that I did not prepare a song. We're going to make a song together. We're going to improvise together because sometimes in psychedelic situations, you find yourself having to improvise. Also, when it seems like the world is ending, you have to improvise. So we're going to make something up together. Does that sound interesting to you? If you're cringing and wishing you've left already, it's too late. You know what I mean? I make songs for a living. I make songs and music videos. And I've been really contemplating this stuff a lot. Recently, I got hired to make a song about uh, direct action, direct ecological action. And I was struggling to make it because I live in this basement in Bushwick. And I just make videos all day and sweat and like eat packaged food. And it's a song about how you're supposed to celebrate, like, let's get out there and compost, you know what I mean? Let's get out there and bring our own cup when we fill it up at the bodega when we're hungover from making our video, you know what I mean? Let's go do some community gardening. But you know what, I do some of that, but mostly I just make videos and I feel cut off from the material conditions of my existence. And it's been a struggle. Do you ever feel this way? Do you ever feel like when we're operating in precisely these ideological spaces where we're jamming together on a particular topic and talking about, talking about it, that the talking about makes it so we're never really acting? Do you ever feel that way? I don't have the answer to how to solve that, but I do have an instinct that psychedelics might be a way for me to access that answer. Because in the psychedelic experiences that I have had, I have become awakened to what's actually there. And what's actually here is matter. Madonna was not incorrect, at least about this. It's a material world. We are made of matter. And our matter is a material collaboration. We're made of a bunch of organisms that are collaborating to make us. Even matter at its inorganic level, so-called, is collaborating to create us. And so when you awaken to that, when you have a psychedelic moment with that, where you realize how much your matter matters, maybe there we take the step to finding the solutions. And the urgency to act doesn't come from, oh shit, we're gonna die, because maybe we are, or maybe two billion of us will. Maybe that's true, but it has to be an end in itself where you're like, I'm here with my matter. Does that make sense to you? So since we're here together right now as material beings, and since matter is a collaboration and action is a collaboration, I want to get deep on that topic together. One way you can refer to the Department of Environmental Thinking that is about really getting into the philosophy of it and grounding itself in that idea is deep ecology. Ever heard of deep ecology? Deep ecology is basically a notion that ecology is not just uh, don't litter. And it's not just about human survival either, even though that's often what we emphasize because we're humans. It's about the interrelation of all beings organic and inorganic. And again, that's a psychedelic space to operate. Psychedelia is literally clear mindedness. So if we combine that with deep ecology, it's clear mindedness about this material world that we have. So on this deep ecological tip, 
I was thinking we could make a song together about that. So it's very simple. We're going to do a call and response. And then, uh, and then I want to find out from you things that make you feel ecologically activated. And we'll put those into the song. Does that make sense? What's something that you do that makes you feel really ecologically activated? Community gardening. Put your hands together for community gardening. When I say deep, you say ecology. Deep. Deep. Psychedelic consciousness and deep ecology. Deep. Deep. Deep ecology, we're right about to do it. Everybody's sitting down, but we can still make some music. It's getting kind of weird. People walking by and I stare at them. I kind of feel like I'm standing inside of a terrarium. Uh, yeah, check out the words that I do. Yo, shout out to Sarah. Not a terrarium, but a virtual zoo. Yeah, exactly. That's how I spit her. Off at the top, I'm doing my thing. Shout out to Marissa. Also a shout out to Steve Dan Ziger. It's not Johnson. I had to switch that. That's a line switcher. I'm just trying to do my thing and stay here in this moment. The people are sitting and filming as I'm making up the poem, huh? Off at the top, I keep on rocking. Right there's my friend Colin. After this, I'll probably call him. Mm, yeah, that's the way that I'm spitting. I hope the number of people that die isn't two billion. 90s, uh, I be rocking beyond most. I'm wriggling like the worms that are down in the compost. Uh, I do my thing and I be spitting it iller. I keep it rolling like a bicycle going by the East River. Yeah, uh, shout out to Wendy in the green map. Where you get your weed? I find that on my green map. <laughs> Got more lines than flannel. That last line, I'll go back, it wasn't planned well. Uh, yeah, check out the way that I'm rapping free. I'm just trying to entertain the people here at the gallery. Right now I'm out in Manhattan, I'm doing it Manhattan Lee. I'm hoping to come off of the top and speak big and happily. That got kind of disorganized, but let me just find it. I'm trying to do my thing and be spitting with these rhymes and with that deep ecology, that deep ecology. When I say deep, you say ecology, that deep, the deep. Psychedelic consciousness and deep ecology. I kind of want to switch the beat up. I kind of want to go hard. You ready to go hard? Yeah, let's really go hard. Let's really, let's really mix it up. Okay. You want to stand up? Let's stand up and just move around a little bit. Okay. So same hook, same hook, but no new movement. I took some notes on the on the uh, on the talks. So let's try and incorporate them. Deep ecology, that deep ecology, psychedelic consciousness and deep ecology. When I say deep, you say ecology, that deep, deep. Uh, we're going hard, I'm about to rock it. I'm trying to make that dough that's regenerative economics. Mm, yeah, exactly. The flows I keep fountain. I keep on flowing off the top like a fountain. Uh, yeah, I do the rhymes that I hope you enjoy well. I got so much flow, I'm like a Chevron oil spill. Uh, yeah, that's the way I be speaking it free oil spill from chevron either that or from bp i keep it bumping in the moment that's the way that i do it off of the top i keep on rocking it we gotta make that music uh i'll be doing my thing i'm talking eco philosophy when i say deep you say ecology deep ecology. deep 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 thanks so much everybody all right so um Everyone, make, I'm going to make it my mission to make sure I meet everyone here tonight that I don't know, and I encourage you to do the same. Cheers. Cheers.